I remember it was February 27th, 2012. We were at our first Mo Mondays. 18 people in the audience upstairs on the second floor of a tea room. 18 people, half of whom were the speakers. The other half was the serving staff. There were no lights, no stage, no sound equipment, no backdrop, no piano. There was tea. Three months later, they kicked us out because we weren't bringing in enough business for them. And we moved to a jazz bar. Now, at the jazz bar, what do they have at a jazz bar that they don't have in a tea room? That's one. The booze. <laughs> There are some smart people in this audience. <laughs> real stage, real music, real sound equipment, real backdrop, and yes, real alcohol. <laughs> but you know, I remember going back to that first Mo Mondays, I remember running out the door and my wife saying, why are you doing this? And I said, I don't know. It was just something that I felt I needed to do. You see, I was so tired of all the standard issue networking events where, you know, you give and get business cards or you, all those association events where everybody tries to appear more successful than they really are. You've been to some, yes. <laughs> or some of those great speaker events where I was jaded by them because you go to the, hear some great speakers. When you get there, you realize all they really want to do is sell you something at the back of the room. And I felt like I wanted something that had the networking and social aspect of a, of a real networking event with the authenticity of a transformational weekend, except you don't have to spend the whole weekend or thousands of dollars doing it, in a fun and social atmosphere. And that's what I wanted from Mo Mondays. So fast forward three months later, we're in this jazz bar, and yes, there was this real alcohol. There was some, th some other change that I'd made. And I started asking my professional speaker friends, I said, share a story that you don't share at your usual corporate event. Share a story that reveals a little bit more about the real you. Tell us about who you are. And I started asking people on stage who had great stories to share, great experiences, great wisdom, but maybe didn't want to become the next big motivational speaker. And to, to be honest, that's when the audiences started growing. You know, 15 people, 18 people, 30 people, 50, 60 people. We were over 100 people a night. It was so exhilarating. And about six months later than that, my friend Stephanie from Winnipeg calls me. She says, I, Michelle, I love what you're doing with Mo Mondays, and I want you to help me do a Mo Mondays here in Winnipeg. And I said, I'm not set up to help anybody else do another. No, I'm not. And she said, yes. And I said, no. And she said, yes. And I said, no. And if you know Stephanie, you know she doesn't give up. She said, yes. And I said, OK. But if I help you do a Mo Mondays in Winnipeg, and if we build the infrastructure and the systems, to help you do that, then we're going to open up to other cities. And she said, yes, because the world needs more Mo Mondays. And that's how we got to 13 cities. And it all grew because somebody came to one city and said, hey, I want to do this. I want to bring this to my town. And that's how it grew from city to city to city. Now, if it looks like I strategically planned it, I was masterful, let me tell you, Nothing could be further from the truth. There was nothing strategic or masterful about it. I mean, yes, it's true. I now consult with major corporations. I help them learn the craft of storytelling. I teach executive storytelling. I travel around the world. And yes, I will be in Jamaica next month. Uh, I was in Washington, DC. I was in San Francisco. And everybody seems to understand the power, the connective power of storytelling. But like I say, it wasn't always this way. In fact, I could remember once I was going through one of those quintessential crises of, 
of just life. What do I do now? I'm sure nobody in this room has ever gone through anything like this. It was like, why is life so hard? Why is it so hard to make a living? I've put a white light around my goals. I've, I've done my dream board, and I'm still not manifesting my dreams. What's wrong with me? I went to my friend, Stuart. And I said, Stuart, you're the smartest person I know. You consult with some of the biggest companies. You're a great strategic thinker. Tell me, Stuart, what should I do? And he looked at me and he thought about it and he said, Michelle, I don't know. Just keep throwing shit at the wall. Eventually, something's going to stick. I said, Stuart, you're the smartest person I know. That's what you got for me? That's it? Keep throwing shit at the wall? you got to be kidding. So I went out and I hired, I hired a business coach. And he said, Michelle, you're speaking. You're running workshops. You're writing. You're coaching. You're doing everything. And you have no focus. In this business, you got to focus, focus, focus. And you're not planning. And if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. You've got to focus. Keep your eye on the prize. What the mind can conceive, you can achieve. But success doesn't happen overnight. I paid for that. And then I was listening to a radio show, which Leonard Cohen was talking about. And he was talking about his song, Hallelujah. You know that song, 1995, it was written for an album called Various Positions. When he wrote it and he recorded it, the producers at, I think it was CBS Records, Sony Records, they, they didn't think it was any good. They said, this is a disaster. This is not pop music. We can't release it. This is no good. This is hallelujah. This is a song that Leonard Cohen is known all around the world for. This is a song that was recorded by just about everybody from Bob Dylan to Bono to Bon Jovi. This is hallelujah. In 2000 and something, it was number one and number two in the Britain's Christmas Music Award, the most coveted music award in the country. This is hallelujah. And the record producers, the executives, the experts in the industry didn't think it was any good. You know, if you saw the movie, the, the movie about Queen, Bohemian Rhapsody, you learn in the movie that the EMI record producer also thought Bohemian Rhapsody, the song, was drivel. And all the critics panned it. Bohemian Rhapsody. I was reading Bruce Springsteen's autobiography. And in it, I learned that you know, on, he had done two albums. His third album, it was going to be Born to Run. Anybody remember that album? He worked one year on that album, six months on that song alone. And by the end of the six months, he hated the record. He wanted to trash the tapes. All he could hear were the imperfections in his work. And it was only because of his guitar, Steen Van Zandt, that he didn't trash the tapes, and it got released to the world. Born to Run. Could you imagine? Born to Run. This is the song that defined my university years. He hated it. He couldn't see it. So, if the paid consultants can't figure out what's good for you, if the industry experts can't pick a winner and don't know what's good and what's bad. And if you yourself can't see the brilliance in your own work, well, maybe Stuart was right. Keep throwing shit at the wall. Thank you very much.